So I will go ahead and we'll get started and I'll, I'll admit folks as, you know, as we go along if there are some stragglers, but thank you all for joining us for our Flocks of Fall, Fall Warbler program. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank Tin Mountain's Nature Program Series sponsors, um, Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment for their support of our programming. I also would love to put in a plug for a few of our upcoming programs because we do have a packed fall and as always fall often is you know, is avian heavy with our programming. So um, in addition to Will's program tonight, um, he is also next Saturday um, on the 26th of September leading um, another bird walk. This one is just north of the notches um, in Gorham on the Presidential Rail Trail there, which if you haven't uh, been on, it's sort of out, uh, the parking area is on the way out to Moosebrook State Park, but it's a lovely, uh, you know, a lovely trail. Um, so that is on a Saturday morning, the 26th. Um, and then the following Tuesday, the 29th, we have Dave Gavatsky joining us for, um, he'll be leading a virtual program on the science of autumn foliage, um, the colors that we see and why we're seeing them. Uh, and then that's a busy week for us because the, that next Thursday, um, the 1st of October, Chris Louie will be um, leading a hawk talk followed by on Saturday the 3rd, a hawk watch um, up at Hackers Hill in Casco, Maine. Um, so that's a nice sort of easy, you can drive right to the top, lots of a nice open spot um, that allows social distancing. So a lot of good programs that we have coming up. Um, for those, so you know, you can you can feel free to email us or call you know call Tin Mountain if you want information on any of those program programs. If you haven't been with, with us for a Zoom program before or in a little while, um, just a reminder that when I turn things over to Will, um, if you have a question, the two best ways to do that are you can type it right into the chat feature um, at the bottom of your screen, um, and I will be monitoring that and if it's sort of an immediate clarifying question i'll you know interrupt will otherwise we'll hold it till the end um and then at the end as well you're welcome to unmute yourself um, and you can um you can ask will questions directly um i think by default everyone was muted as they entered the program that's not because we don't want to hear your lovely voices uh, but it really is because we don't want to hear your lovely voices or the, the background noises going on in your households while Will is presenting. Um, so it's ju just because it's amazing what our computers pick up uh, that we don't realize we're broadcasting to the rest of the group. Um, and, and lastly, the last thing I will say before I turn things over to Will is that if you have been enjoying Tin Mountain's virtual programs, um, you know, we would encourage you to support us in one of two ways, either, you know, if you are a member, thank you so much. We appreciate, you know, all that you do and, and that goes to supporting our programming. Um, if you're not a member um, and you are able to support us, we have on our webpage, tinmountain.org, right at the top, a support us button. And there is a spot, you know, to donate, you know, five or ten dollars directly to our nature program series. So um, that does help us as we, you know, as we're moving forward and, you know, and planning for, you know, for the fall and winter programming. Um, otherwise, again, Thank you all for, for joining us, and I am going to hand things over to Will. Great. Thanks, Nora. Let me share my screen. Okay. Everyone sees these beautiful warblers. Okay. So, thank you all for coming to this program tonight virtually. We are in the heart of fall migration. It just seems like yesterday that I was giving the spring version of this talk, um, but now we've moved forward in time and the birds have begun their southern migration 
They have had their young and they are heading back to the land of their origins, actually. Um, warblers evolved in southern uh, Central America, and that is where the most biodiversity of warblers exists. So one theory for why um, at least these species migrate is back to this area is to go to their ancestral homeland. So in this talk, we're going to cover 25 species, the same 25 that we covered in May, but this time our birds are going to look pretty different. And in this opening slide, you'll see a few species here, which I have included. These are going to be our quiz birds. So feel free to look at these birds and write down what you think they might be. And we're going to talk about our 25 species. And then at the end, we're going to talk about these um, subset and uh, use them uh, use some of their characteristics to help us ID them. So we're going to get into this. All right, so we're going to talk about our field marks first. Um, and uh, I'll get, get to that slide in just a moment. And we'll go through our 25 fall warblers. We're going to do our quick quiz, talk about some rarities that we might see um, typically in the fall, and then some resources and some questions. All right. So let's get to it. Let's talk about field marks. And this is a pine warbler. This is one of the very first warblers that uh, returns in springtime. And is actually one of the latest warblers to leave. So this is a great um, kind of pilot warbler, great bird to look at. It's got a lot of uh, unique features that help us um, learn about different field marks. So we're gonna look at the eyes for all of our birds. We're gonna talk about whether or not these birds have full or partial eye rings, maybe an eye line, talk about their supercilium or eyebrow, and perhaps whether or not um, they have spectacles or you know, might look like they're wearing glasses, which is pretty neat. The wings, we're gonna look at the presence or absence of wing bars. And we're gonna look at the um, kind of body plan, the overall pattern of the plumage of the body, um, and whether or not there might be streaking on the um, breast and belly along with the color of the vent and the rump. So these are all really important uh, aspects of field marks that we'll get into for each of our 25. Alrighty, so I've included uh, the lineup here is, the lineup of my 25 roughly corresponds to the exit strategy of our warblers. So in this um, photo, the bird on the left is probably the very first bird to leave New Hampshire in the warbler family, and that's going to be your Louisiana water thrush. On the right, you have our northern water thrush, which does stick around a little while longer. Its range is further north into Canada, whereas Louisiana just barely makes it into some, uh, central New Hampshire. And so this is one of the very first birds um, to leave. And so they look very similar, the bird on the left and the bird on the right are incredibly uh, closely related, but you'll notice there are some really important key differences. One is the supercilium or eyebrow. Notice the bird on the left, the eyebrow is large in the back of the head and tapers towards the front, whereas the bird on the right, the eyebrow is more or less uniform um, throughout the top of its head. And also, if you'll look at the throat of both of these birds. Um, the bird on the left is the Louisiana. Again, they typically have a more clear throat and more sparse spotting on the uh, lower throat and belly and breast area uh, versus bird on the, the right here. This is our northern water thrush and it's going to have kind of a more dirty looking throat, kind of like um, the, the dark splotches kind of come up into the throat and then they're essentially covering more of this bird's um, breast and belly region uh, than the Louisiana. So at this time of year, uh, you know, we're entering middle of September, it's going to be really uncommon to get a Louisiana water thrush in New Hampshire, at least in central New Hampshire where most of us are tuning in from. So we're more likely to be getting the northern water thrush. And it's also important to note, I'm just going to go back to uh, this slide just to have us look at these two birds. It's important to note their behavior, foraging behavior. These birds love to be on the ground, walking around. They're also going to be bobbing their tails. 
um, and they're going to be associated with flowing water in, in woodlands. So these are really important um, parts of the field marks and behavior to, to keep, in, um, uh, keep in your head when you're out looking at these species. Um, for the most part, unless there's some glaring uh, examples to, to share with you, we're not going to be going through vocalizations. Many of these birds are going to be silent on fall migration. Um, however, there's a lot of uh, research and science out there that um, talk about nocturnal flight calls that all of these birds make as they're flying south. Um, but we're not going to overwhelm the audience with all the different you know, call notes of these species. So we're really gonna stick to our um, field marks and a bit about the behavior as well. Okay, so in my experience, uh, the kind of the next warbler to exit um, New England is going to be this one, the Canada warbler. So interestingly enough, um, if you look at the eBird uh, website uh, for tracking bird migration and bird sightings, you'll notice that by mid-September, many um, males of many of these, you know, let's say half of these warblers that I'm going to share with you, the first half, many of the males have already made it to their wintering territories. So it's the case with the Canada warbler um, that the upper left hand corner, this bright looking beautiful male, is already in uh, Central America, which is really incredible. Whereas the birds um, on the right, on the uh, upper right and lower right, these are going to be younger birds, possibly hatchier birds, that are going to take their time to get down to the wintering grounds. And with this species, you know, the bird on the upper left is that classic male that we would have talked about in the spring presentation. But really, in the fall, a lot of these birds, they're going to have the same kind of structural characteristics of, uh, of, of plumage, but a lot of it's going to be faded when it comes to the color that we're looking at. The structure is going to be the same, but it's going to be the color that starts to fade out and really is associated with the younger, uh, the younger birds. Um, and in many cases, the non-breeding adults. Um, but the younger birds are going to be the most tricky for many of us to identify. So with Canada Warbler, you're really going to be looking at that sharp contrast between that almost slate gray back and the lemon yellow throat and belly. That's really helpful. That, that uh, contrast is, is really helpful. Another great giveaway is going to be that big, bold eye ring. So that's going to be clear in all plumages. Um, I've also added this um, aspect. You're going to have the necklace of the adult male on the left. It's bold, but in these younger individuals, possibly first year, half year females, um, there might be very uh, kind of um, faint necklacing, but then in the bird in the upper right, barely anything at all. So um, that's why I added that, that kind of aspect as the, as the last um, piece here to, to keep in mind. Because while the necklace is really bold in the, in the adult male, sometimes it's going to be faded and even absent in the younger birds. Also important here, look at the, the rear end of the bird, the vent, it's white. So um, there is that you know, three kind of color contrasts in the bird on the upper right. You've got that slate gray, the yellow belly, and then the, the white vent. So that's really helpful. These are birds that actually nest um, in, in wet thickets uh, further north in central and northern New Hampshire um, associated with the, the northern forest. Um, and so these birds typically like to associate with these habitats on their flight south. So you might get them in uh, more dense, tangled, thicket environments. And again, this is one of the first birds to exit the state in, uh, in September. Along with that, another northern warbler. We have the Wilson's warbler here. Looks a lot like a yellow warbler, but notice overall the, the upper portion of the body is going to be kind of that pea green color. So really um, take a look at that color and then compare it to the yellow warbler um, as we'll get to later. So Clearly, you know, in the adult male, you're going to have that cap, that black cap, and which is faded in the adult female, and then very much faded in the younger half year birds that are coming, uh, coming up um, and going to be taking, you know, a little bit of time to head south 
uh, whereas those adult males are going to be jet setting um, for their southern climbs uh, pretty much right now. Notice also this bird likes to hold its wings out a lot like a red star. So when you see this bird foraging, again, a thicket dweller, really loves dense tangles. It's a very frenetic, very active feeding bird, much like a red star. You'll see it perched and then it'll just fall out of the sky and go after an insect, um, usually in midair, and then go back into the tangle. So these birds kind of keep their wings open, almost like they're ready to just jump um, and, and drop um, on an insect. So that's really helpful. They're a really beautiful bird. Again, uh, very, very intense yellow in the face, very plain face, uh, but then that kind of fades to this green um, it, into the, the upper part of the body, the mantle, and then the, the, um, the rump, the upper part of the rear end of the bird. So that's really an arrow just to indicate that that different color, the difference um, from the yellow warbler, which is really that intense yellow throughout the body. Okay, another skulker of, uh, of, of uh, dense tangles, but also just generally um, a ground dwelling bird. This is our morning warbler, mourning for that hooded veil appearance of the adult male in the upper right. Another bird who, uh, whose males are going to look pretty similar in the fall as in the spring, and they're gonna be um, heading right south uh, for their winter climbs. And then the younger birds on the, on the lower um, image here, the two images on the, on the bottom part of the screen, they're gonna take their time a little bit to get to their, to their southern uh, wintering spots. Again, the hood is really prominent in the, um, the adult male. Um, but take a look at the, essentially on the, the left, the upper left hand image, that's gonna be more typically of your non-breeding female type birds adult females, you've got that faint hood appearance. And then again, you know, that dark contrasting with the lemon yellow belly is really key. In all uh, of the non-breeding plumage uh, morning warblers, you're going to have a varying amount of eye ring, which is really interesting. Um, and that can be pretty typical um, of this species, but it can also make it tough to ID and separated out from a couple more Western warblers, notably Connecticut and McGillivray's warbler. Um, so when we get to the Connecticut warbler later on in the program, in my kind of roundup of a couple rarities, we'll talk about the differences. But notice um, in the uh, in these ones, look at that eye ring. It's it's actually kind of broken. It, it's it's separated right in the middle of the eye. Um, and it's and it's going to be faint compared to the Connecticut, which has a very bold eye ring. This bird in the um, lower right, I've put an arrow on its tail. So this is really an important field mark. This bird appears to have a very short tail because the feathers that cover its bent, um, the undertail covert feathers, really extend far down the tail, which makes the tail look really short um, and kind of looks like in a funny way, it kind of looks like a football, um, and, and that can be helpful in identifying this warbler, but also um, the other two warblers that I mentioned in the same genus, the Connecticut and the McGillivray's warbler. They just have that really short, stubby tail look, and that um, the, the yellow really extends far out on that tail. Um, it's interesting, you'll look at um, the bird on the left, the lower left, and you'll say, gosh, that looks a lot like a young yellow throat. And we'll talk about it when we get to the yellow throat, how it's different. Um, but again, really try to focus on that. If you can see the undertail coverts, that can be really helpful. But the behavior is going to be different too. Um, the, this bird is such a skulker, it's, it really doesn't like to be seen. And it has a very different um, call note. I know, I know I mentioned, we're probably not going to mention call notes too often, but this one has a call note that I would describe it saying titch, titch, and it's uh, really almost like kind of like a, a high pitched um, but kind of piercing note and it's going to be coming from tangles, um, whereas the, the yellow throat has a very different call note, um, which we can talk about when we get down to the, to the yellow throat. 
So again, a, a great bird to see um, and a bird that's gonna be heading out of New Hampshire pretty soon here. And I just noted that the, the eye ring is, is key in these non-breeding and young birds. All right, this bird also, um, it, similar to an earlier species we talked about, this reaches its northern end of its range in central New Hampshire. This is the prairie warbler. So some field notes for this guy, um, some field marks, lemon yellow belly, really, um, really prominent in the adult male and the non-breeding um, uh, male and female, and even in the young as well. What's also really helpful, it has this little dark mark below the eye. And in all plumages, you're going to have that. I kind of call this kind of the bags under the eyes appearance, like this bird's perpetually exhausted. And that can be really helpful in the field when you see this bird. Also, this um, up and down arrow means uh, something unique. This bird uh, actually bobs its tail. So that's a really helpful field mark for um, prairie warbler. So this is a, a really unique um, species that we get kind of close, uh, closer to Madison and, and Eaton, some of these places that have really well-developed uh, sand plains and scrub type environments. I see them a lot more in like a, the semi-open um, uh, uh, power line cuts and things like that in central New Hampshire. Um, so this is a, a great species. And you're going to get them actually overwintering the southeast and in Florida. So we, we get these on the continent still, um, even through the winter. All right, an incredibly uh, recognizable species, the black and white warbler. It looks really similar to its uh, spring and summer colors. The, the male in the lower right hand corner, um, that classic, uh, you know, black and white zebra look. Notice uh, the facial pattern, that, that black cheek is really a prominent adult male characteristic. And then notice the other two birds whose faces you can see. Um, that starts to fade as you get into the adult female, and then especially in the hatchier children. Um, the bird on the top right is going to have that really plain looking face. But in all plumages, you're going to have the double white wing bars, and you're going to have these black chevrons on the vent or the rear end of the bird. So that's really helpful. And in many cases, you're going to struggle when you're looking up at these birds to see what they are based on just what you can see, which is often the vent of the bird. But this bird gives it right away. It's the only warbler that has these little arrows pointing out towards the tail. So that's really helpful. What's also great about this bird is it's really one of the only warblers we have that uh, walks up and down tree limbs like a nuthatch. So that's really um, a, a really helpful field mark for this species. All right, moving right along, we have our northern perula. So in none of these photos do I have a, an adult, you know, a bright shining adult male or female. So these are really that faded fall winter look of uh, an otherwise pretty common warbler that we have in northern New Hampshire. But in all plumages, uh, you're going to have those white eye arcs, so kind of a broken eye ring. So that's really helpful. You're also going to have two white wing bars and varying amounts of yellow in the in the throat. So that's really key. And also take a look at the bill. This is a bicolored bill, kind of a gray uh, top to the to the um, to the beak, and then kind of a tan or flesh colored lower mandible. So that's really helpful too. This bird also appears very small. It's one of our smaller warblers. So you'll see it and you'll just think, oh, this is a really small bird. It's a very short, thin, sharp bill. Uh, so that does add to the, to the ID. But really keep an eye on those three arrows there, the, the eye arcs, the wing bars, and the um, varying degrees of yellow in the, in the throat. That's really helpful. And the birds on the right, you know, they have those characteristics as well. Um, but they're younger birds, they're hatchier birds, and they're gonna be appearing much duller and faded compared to uh, the adults. So that's really helpful. Sometimes um, when you see them too, it's just, it's, it's an incredible mix of pastel colors. I think um, other than the, the non-breeding prairie warbler, I think the, um, 
the young perulas are some of my favorite plumage colors in a warbler. There's a sharp bill. All right, moving right into our yellow warbler. Again, a, a species that's going to be looking pretty similar all year round. Of course, in the upper left, you have a male, an adult male that's starting to fade out of its summer plumage with those really bold red striping down the front. Um, and this, so there's going to be a varying amount of, of that striping in this, in this species. But notice a really plain looking face. I kind of call it the jaws effect, that black eye that has you know, a faint yellow eye ring around it, um, but otherwise an incredibly uh, uh, pale, uh, plain face, just yellow overall, um, darker on the back of the bird. Um, and of course the, the, the wing kind of coverts and the wing bars are gonna be yellow as well, um, but there's really no distinctive kind of wing bars in the way that the, the other species we've gone through have. Um, look at the vent. The, the vent is yellow. Um, not a lot of our warblers are going to have that characteristic. And so that's really helpful too. Also notice how large this bill is. That's really key uh, for separating out, it out compared to some of the other similarly orange looking um, species uh, like orange crown warbler. You're going to have a much smaller, sharper bill um, similar to Nashville and a couple others that we'll get to. Um, so this is a large build warbler, so that's really helpful. These birds are, are coming through there, you know, you've seen them in um, semi-open, semi-wetland uh, fields and thickety, sparse thicket habitats. They love um, kind of willow uh, wetlands, things like that. So they'll be, they'll be moving um, down the coast and down the continent shortly here. All right, uh, this is a bird that looks very different, I think, from its um, adult plumage in the summer, spring and summertime. This is chestnut-sided warbler. And you can see an adult male in his non-breeding plumage in the top left of the image here. So you've got that really broad chestnut um, going down the, the, the length of his his belly uh, into his flanks, and that's going to be variable. So the adult males will kind of have the most coverage, fading all the way to zero coverage in the immature hatchier females. Um, so you'll notice some uniting characteristics of all of these forms. You've got a kind of messy white, double white wing bars here. You've also got a white eye ring, which is which is key. A very plain chest throat through the vent um, is this plain kind of gray, off gray, white, uh, whitish coloration. So really unique um, looking bird. And um, as I mentioned, the varying amounts of, of chestnut, uh, which, is, which is nice. So these birds are so headed south. Um, and many of these species, as, as we get through here, you'll see them in mixed groups. Uh, so they'll actually be forming flocks of many different kinds of warblers. And they'll often move around with uh, other species of birds altogether, things like vireos um, and uh, even sometimes loosely associated with thrushes. But, uh, but uh, it's really helpful when you're out birding looking for fall warblers. I've mentioned, I mentioned this in the um, spring talk, follow the resident birds, chickadees, nuthatches, titmice, uh, creepers, downy woodpeckers, all of these birds flock up in the fall and winter and they uh, usually have a gaggle of warblers hanging out with them as well. So that can be really helpful. You know, find the, the, the native uh, residents and um, follow them around and see if they've got some warblers hanging out with them. And of course the the, the green back is one of the biggest differences between the um, adult male chestnut sided and his, and his children um, and his uh, non-breeding plumage. That's just a beautiful cast to the back of the bird. It's this, um, this really unique color of green, a really um, special species to, to behold when we're out watching. Really stunning species. Again, uh, another species that, um, similar to some of the other ones we've talked about, really doesn't change a whole lot through the through the um, 
summer to winter plumage uh, variation, you've got the American red star, the adult male in the lower left. You have a first year male in the upper right. Um, you can start to see a little bit of that dark flecking coming in to the face. Um, and you've got a possible hatchier female um, on the upper left. Uh, what do all of these things have in common? Well, they have these beautiful patches of, of, in the case of the adult male, orange, in the case of the female um, and younger male, that you're going to have yellow patches um, on the underarm, on the wing, and on the tail. So this is really key. And this is um, an adaptation to help startle insects and have insects kind of move out ahead of them as they're uh, making their way along tree branches. It's a, it's a feeding mechanism. This bird, similar to the Wilson's warbler, will hold its wings out. Again, a very frenetic, quick moving bird. Um, you'll see these guys drop right out of the forest and come, come back up, kind of like a flycatcher. Um, so these wing, open wings seem to me an adaptation to just being ready uh, when the insect comes by to just lunge at it. Um, but it's also helpful too, because you've got your, your wing patches um, out and, and you'll see them moving their wings um, down a branch and, and really scaring up these insects. It's really quite fascinating. Um, so this bird, similar in essentially all plumages through the year, a really stunning um, species. All right, this species can be uh, quite tough for folks in the fall, I found. This is Blackburnian warbler and the adult male on the lower right um, gives, you, gives it away. So uh, this species is, again, another one of these that's coming through that's not really going to stay through um, October or so. It's, it's going to be out of here. Um, but uh, check out the double white wing bars. That's really key in all um, plumages. You've also got that lemon yellow throat and, and into the belly. That's really helpful. And then you've got this dark cheek patch, and that's going to be um, visible in all plumages and genders. Um, you know, the difference being between the adult male that we might all recognize and these younger individuals. Um, just notice how much fading has gone on, and I'll take this in this arrow away to, to take note of that fading that's happened in the, in the um, face and in the chest in, uh, in regards to the yellow. So you've still got that um, big eyebrow, that, that yellow eyebrow, but it's not nearly as like flaming orange as it is in the adult male. It's really quite faded. But if you really focus on that um, facial patch, that dark patch, that's, uh, that's really key um, along with the double white wing bars. Um, that's that's really helpful. And the extent of yellow, as I said, uh, it's it's not variable. It's it's in its extent, really, it's going to be variable in its um, level of intensity with the adult male being most intense and the uh, those first year half year females being um, really faded out like in, in the upper right hand image. All right, uh, another bird that doesn't change much through the year, the oven bird, um, a bird of the ground, a, a warbler that walks. Um, so that's really a unique characteristic when you see this bird on the ground and on branches, it is physically walking, not hopping. So that's a really great field mark. Of course, it has the bold white eye ring. It has these bold dark stripes on the white uh, chest. But if you get a chance to see the cap, you're going to see that um, really unique um, brown and black stripe on the, on the very top of the head of the bird, which is not always visible um, unless you get to see it on the ground walking around. Um, but again, this bird loves to be on the ground um, and, it, and it is a walker. So that's really, really helpful. So this is the oven bird. Okay, this is a species I think people might have trouble with in the fall because it, the non-breeding adult male and, um, you know, the, the children of the summer season look pretty different. Um, so the upper right hand portion uh, the photo is the black bearded green warbler adult male fading into its uh, non-breeding uh, plumage. And you see the extent of that rich black 
um, bib is is going away and it's going to be fading to something like in the lower right hand image which um, you can almost not see it at all but keep an eye out because there are uh, features on this bird that don't change throughout the year like it's double white wing bars it's yellow face and especially the, the you know the the yellow that kind of surrounds a darker eye patch but really that yellow supercilium or eyebrow is really helpful um, and I find that this bird is actually really plain below. So if you look at um, the, the, the belly, if you're below this bird and you see, see that you've got the yellow a little bit on the face, um, but otherwise it's, it's white from the, basically the bottom of the base of the bill all the way through its vent um, with maybe some dark flecking on both sides, that's a good chance that you've got a uh, black throated green warbler. Because once the, the males and females fade out, of that summer breeding plumage, they're more or less um, white, uh, you know, from their throat through their tail. So that can be, that can throw people off because they're not seeing that rich um, yellow face of even the green back and top of the head. Um, but, but that can be helpful if you're looking um, from below. Uh, but again, this, this species kind of coming through will linger a little bit into late September and early October. Um, but they're they're coming through in decent numbers where I am in southern Maine, um, another breeder of um, of our northern hardwood warblers. And the white bent, uh, just to reiterate that extent of the white. And uh, kind of going back and forth between birds that change a lot, birds that don't change too much through the summer into the fall. This is black-throated blue warbler, male in the upper left and lower right, and female in the upper right and lower left. Uh, this bird is really, you know, the males with this beautiful contrast between the slate blue and um, upper part of the wings and top of the head and back, and its black face and um, the, the black line that extends from the, the face along its flanks. Really um, in incredible um, contrast there. Um, and the female has this very thin supercilium, this white supercilium, along with a lower eye arc. So that's that's a really unique characteristic. If you can get that um, burned into your head, you know that can be really helpful. And this is this is a species whose males and females look incredibly different. Um, so they can be really tough. But one thing that unites them, the little white handkerchief on the on the inner portion of the wing. Both males and females have it. And so if you have this um, species, you're not sure what it is, take a look at those wings and you'll see that white wing patch. Uh, so that's, that's really helpful. And I've seen these, um, me, you know, meandering into the fall, um, into early October um, here in New England. All right, this is one of my favorite warblers. The adult males are absolutely stunning. Um, but I really like the non-breeding and the and the young of the year uh, plumage types as well. Really subtle, really difficult um, to ID in some situations because of the stunning differences between the hatchier females and the adult males. A really big range of color. And this is Cape May Warbler. The upper right, you see a, an adult male fading from its uh, breeding plumage into um, into the winter uh, plumage, non-breeding plumage. You see that red cheek fading out to gray, um, but something that all of the uh, plumage types will have is this really delicate faint uh, streaking on the chest. That's something that you'll get um, in, in all plumages, in all genders. You also get a yellow rump, so similar to yellow rump warbler. The Cape May warbler has a yellow rump also has an eye line, so the dark line that extends from just ahead of the eye, in front of the eye, through the back. That's really helpful. What's also unique, this is one of the, really one of the only warblers that has a slight decurved or downcurved bill. So it comes to a very sharp point, it kind of drops a little bit. Um, and this is an adaptation for um, piercing into uh, nectar producing flowers. 
um, and, and fruits. So this is a, a bird that while it lives in the north and, and you know, makes its life appear in the summer, um, it's eating insects. On the southern um, breed, on the southern wintering grounds down in the Bahamas, this bird is more or less exclusively a nectar feeding uh, bird. It's, re it's really quite astonishing difference in diet, um, similar as to the Tennessee warbler, another more or less exclusive northern boreal forest warbler that then goes down to the tropics and feeds on flowers. It's really uh, quite astonishing. Um, I also noticed this uh, too, is that in many of the plumages, you're going to have some amount of yellow mixed in to the throat and face area. Um, it's not present in some of these younger female uh, hatchier type birds, but in the um, adult male and female non-breeding, you're going to get some amount of yellow wash, which is uh, really helpful um, with, again, with those really faint streakings. Um, really a beautiful plumage in my opinion. Um, I could also mention the bright single white wing bar, um, which is much more prominent in the breeding um, males and females, but we can, uh, we, we don't need to focus on that in, in the fall. So I just mentioned uh, this species, this is Tennessee warbler. This is a bird that appears to be small um, it has a short tail, so that kind of gives this bird a, a smaller appearance, a shorter um, tailed appearance. Uh, and take a look at the, um, the overall color of this bird is, is kind of greenish. So that's something to keep in mind, but the vent area is white. So, you know, that's, that's key um, to uh, identifying this bird um, and and telling it apart from another sharp, short, a uh, sharp build, short build um, warbler of the late fall, which is orange crowned, which has a, a yellow uh, vent. So that's, um, that's key um, with that species. But this is a nice contrast between that, that kind of pea green overall color and the white vent. You're also going to notice this dark eye line. That's really key. Um, for identifying this species. So the dark line that extends forward from the eye and back to the back of the head there. So that's really helpful. And a short, sharp bill. So uh, that is very clear in these photos and in the field as well. So this is Tennessee warbler, another northern boreal forest warbler that makes its way south and um, changes its diet pretty, pretty uh, dramatically. We've talked about these short sharp bill and the appearance of the short tail. All right, another boreal warbler. This bird looks so different from its breeding plumage. This is bay breasted warbler. And bay breasted warbler and black pole warbler are can be very difficult to tell apart in the fall, but we're going to go through a couple of field marks to help us. So double white wing bars, uh, which is helpful for IDing this warbler, of course, doesn't help you tell it apart from the black pole because that also has double white wing bars. Um, but the next field mark will help you. So if you look at the uh, legs and feet of this warbler, it will be black, dark gray and black throughout the entire length of the, uh, of the leg and foot and toes. So that's really key. That is the biggest um, ID mark for telling this species from a uh, black pole warbler. You know, and the birds on the, on the left-hand side of the image here, you see the extent of the bay uh, in, in the side, the, the chestnut wash. That can be really prominent on adult non-breeding birds, males and females, but it's going to be absent from some individuals. Um, and so that, that's not a field mark that you're going to want to rely on. You're really going to want to focus on the double white wing bars, the, um, the black feet, um, and the bay, uh, <laughs> which, as I said, is on many individuals, but not on all. 
What I find um, can be really helpful is that this bird appears to be mostly uh, without any streaking from its throat through its belly. So compared to um, uh, black hole, which has a bit more streaking, um, that can be that can be helpful. And and when I'm seeing this bird, so many times you're gonna see the bird in the upper left, and you see a really like cream colored, very plain belly. This bird is also larger than um, the majority of the other warblers, so it's going to appear a bit chunkier, um, a bit plainer in in my experience. Um, but again, those black legs and feet are critical. So uh, moving into, so again, to recap the way I'm doing this chronologically is essentially is to show you what birds are going to be kind of exiting the state first. Um, and now we're kind of getting into late September birds, early October. And so I've seen this species, Nashville warbler, uh, remain into early October. So um, this bird, you know, looks a lot like a couple of the other species we've had. Um, it's got a, similar to the Tennessee warbler, it's got a kind of an overall green upper portion of the body. Um, but look at that face. You've got that really clear demarcation um, between, the, uh, uh, between the top of the head, which is very gray, and that lemon yellow throat. You're also going to have an incredibly bold white eye ring, so that's really helpful. Um, so those, uh, those three marks are really helpful to telling this bird um, from other warblers. You're also going to have a yellow vent in this species. So I have mistaken this bird for orange crowned warbler. Both have very short, sharp bills, but keep an eye out on that eye ring in Nashville. Um, the, the Nashville warbler is going to have the white eye ring in all the plumages um, and the uh, golden crowned warbler uh, is going to have more or less an eye line. It's not going to really have an, uh, 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 basically a line around the eye, an eye ring. It's not going to have that. It's going to have a, a, an eye strike, which we'll, we'll talk about when we get to that warbler. And again, just notice that short, short sharp bill, um, a, a, another warbler that's coming through now and will linger a little bit into early fall. Bird that lingers kind of later into the fall, I find, um, especially as we get closer to southern New Hampshire and the coast, um, is common yellow throat. And in all plumages, you're going to have an extent of yellow from the bottom of the bill down through its belly. Um, in the adult males that are uh, fading into their fall plumage, you're going to have that dark mask, that visor um, type look. Um, there's going to be a varying amount of, of white bordering the top of that, um, but really you're going to be um, looking at the, the presence of this lemon yellow um, throat and upper belly, contrasting that with this olive gray, um, you know, uh, brownish coloration that is really throughout the entire bird. Um, also something of note, um, it also has a uh, yellow vent, so you're not going to always see it. This bird is a skulker, loves to be in uh, wetland thickets. Um, hard to see, um, but uh, quite uh, inquisitive if you pish, if you make a, a noise that um, helps to pull birds out. Uh, you purse your lips together and, and uh, you know, bring the air through your lips and, and basically mimic an angry tufted titmouse. This is one of the birds that'll come right out to you, um, the common yellow throat. So uh, again, a skulker. And it's, it's going to be important thinking about this bird um, as it relates to the Connecticut warbler and even the morning warbler, which has that football shaped appearance. Take a look at this bird's tail as a longer tail. Um, and uh, it's, it's going to be on the ground, but it's also going to be kind of moving up through the foliage a bit, a bit more than these other um, ground-dwelling skulking uh, warblers. So this is um, common yellow throat, and it's going to remain later into the fall than the earlier warblers we've already covered. 
Um, and something else, this last field mark here is the presence of a, a kind of a variable um, faint eye ring, a white eye ring in some of the younger, um, younger birds. So that can be helpful when you're um, looking at this bird, but it's very faint, it's very thin. Um, so don't, don't always use it to, to call this bird out. The bird in the upper right has kind of a, a more of that traditional very thin uh, white eye ring. Okay, so the bird that looks uh, a heck of a lot like the bay-breasted warbler in the fall, uh, basically it's, its boreal twin is the um, black bull warbler. A uh, bird that we get breeding in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, um, and a bird that lingers uh, well into mid-October. Um, I've had it through central New Hampshire um, into the third week in October. But take a look at those feet. So one way people remind themselves about the black bull warbler, they say black bull yellow soul, because some portion of that foot, it might only be the toes or the pads on the bottom of their feet might be yellow. So that's really, really key. Think of them as like mini snowy egrets with their little yellow feet. Um, double white wing bars, same as black pole, war uh, black pole same as bay breasted warbler and many of the other warblers we've had. Um, yellow feet, uh, take a look at that eye line, that's really helpful. Um, this bird is overall kind of a um, uh, well, yellow green is more of what I would characterize the color in the um, adult males of the non-breeding plumage. Um, and they also tend to be a bit more streaked, as you can see in both the bottom images. But take a look at the top. Gosh, these two hatchier, likely female birds um, are really tough. Um, but again, you've got that overall kind of yellow green appearance, you've got the eye strike, you've got the yellow portion of the feet, and then you have the double white wing bars. Um, but these two top birds, they'll, they'll throw you off. And I put these in deliberately to, um, to, to see the contrast between the very, you know, what we might say very familiar looking fall warbler plumage of the adults versus the children on the top. Um, but again, you look at those field marks that all plumage and uh, all plumages, all genders, all ages have, um, and you'll, you'll get there. And throughout. So we've got um, a few more to get through. This is magnolia warbler. And magnolia warblers, in my experience, you know, no matter what kind of plumage they look like, they've got this uh, gray mantle, the gray, you know, top of the head, yellow bottom of the head, um, a, a fainter uh, white eye ring than, um, than our Nashville warbler. Um, but the double white wing bars really is helpful uh, for ID. You've got a varying amount of um, black flecking over the yellow on the, on the sides. Um, but the real key in the upper left hand portion is this field mark. The very end of the tail, good portion of the end of the tail, I should say, is, is jet black. So that's really, really helpful, along with the white vent. Um, so when you're out there looking at a warbler and you've got this yellow belly, white vent, gray back with white wing bars, um, that's magnolia. And the the clincher is always that black tail. Really different looking from the adult male um, of this species, but, uh, but this I think is really a beautiful bird and you'll get them into late October um, foraging um, closer to the ground. I find uh, as the weather gets colder and colder, a lot of these birds are finding insect life um, closer to the ground, which can be really great for photography. Uh, so that is, that is our magnolia or Maggie warbler. And I added this last arrow here just to show the kind of demarcation between the, the gray um, top of the head and the, and the yellow throat and belly. Sometimes there's a faint, almost like a faint gray collar um, that almost seems kind of left over from its uh, dark necklace of the, of the spring and summertime. Um, but that can be, that can be variable and, and 
and a bit faint and hard to see in the field. All right, so we're now getting into the final stretch of warblers that we see in um, fall. Uh, this is palm warbler. We've got two races, uh, two populations of, war of palm warbler that we get in New England in the fall. The upper left is the western palm warbler, um, which breeds in kind of the, the taiga uh, in Alaska and points um, south. And then you've got the kind of the northern um, and taiga and kind of, I want to say like uh, 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 Nova Scotia, Quebec, um, the yellow palm warbler. So you've got the lower left is yellow, upper right, uh, upper left is, um, is the western. Both have a uh, dark cheek, uh, dark eye line, and a tiny little kind of handlebar mustache that comes down, which gives it a little bit of a complex facial pattern. Both also have yellow uh, vents. And what's really helpful too, when you're following these birds and they often are feeding on the ground, running around feeding on the ground almost like a, like a robin, um, they have this outer white tail feathers that, that kind of sparkle in the, in the sun when they're flying away from you. So this is a really helpful bird. And then similar to prairie warbler, this bird bobs its tail. So these are some incredible field marks to get this species down, um, more or less foolproof. Um, even if you're dealing with a very, uh, very plain looking bird, like in the lower uh, right hand corner, perhaps a, a, a hatchier male or female, um, but you've got these characteristics that will help you out. This is palm warbler. Pine warbler, uh, one of the very last to leave the state. Incredible variability in this bird's plumage. In the lower left is the adult male, that lemon yellow, stunning yellow um, face and, and uh, upper belly region. Um, two white wing bars that can be faded in younger birds, but you've still got um, the, the, the light colored wing bars there. Upper right, I've highlighted the um, spectacles, so it looks like this bird is wearing light-colored glasses. In the um, in the case of the lower left, you've got the male that has the yellow spectacles. In the case of this bird, the probably a hatchier, um, perhaps a hatchier female, has white spectacles. Also has um, a pretty large uh, uh, bill, so that's really helpful too. If you're really kind of um, you know, trying to figure out what this bird is. Take a look at the, the bill structures. Um, it's a longer, bigger bill. Um, and this bird is also a denizen of pine forest. So you're going to really see them associating with their, their, their host tree, uh, so to speak. Um, white pines and pitch pines too. So this is a bird you can see in all these different plumages, some incredible variability um, in, in this uh, plumage. And you know, it makes it difficult, but also makes it exciting for when you're out there seeing these different plumages. All right, and I believe this is my final warbler here. This is yellow rumped, again, a bird of many plumages, but if we focus on some very specific field marks, we will have it every time. Uh, white eye arcs, so not a white eye ring, but a broken eye ring into eye arcs. A dark uh, face patch, a dark patch kind of around the ear area, contrasting with a white or light throat. So those three things, I can look at essentially any uh, yellow rump in, in any age, and as, and as long as you have those characteristics, you'll get it. Um, you just get that, got to get that search image down. You can see it in the lower right-hand image, an incredibly plain looking bird, but it's got the eye arcs, it's got the dark face, uh, facial uh, patch ear area contrasted with that lighter throat. And if you're not convinced by that, keep watching the bird and you'll get to see the namesake yellow rump, which is really uh, helpful. Um, but don't always go on those yellow patches under the wing. Those can fade um, and be non-existent in some of those hatch year birds. So um, that can be helpful, but not always um, a sign. Uh, not always a reliable field mark. Um, and then double white wing bars, which in the bird that I showed you, kind of smudgy, 
um, but that can be also helpful to, to look at this uh, bird. All right, so we've got our quiz birds now. And um, I would say if, uh, so if oh, I'm curious how we want to do this, but these are the birds that I shared earlier. Um, we, can, we can go through um, each of these uh, species and I think you can see my, yeah, you can see my um, mouse here. So this bird on the upper left, double white wing bars, kind of a greenish uh, top to the bird. You can see this interesting pattern here, kind of a dark, darker side, very plain looking. Um, gosh, it looks like this bird has dark legs um, and maybe some faint eye line here, but where I'm looking here, I'm going to be focused on these double white wing bars, this really kind of plain looking belly, and then the giveaway here is this, this the, the chestnut size of this um, adult uh, non-breeding bay breasted warbler. And I gave a, another hint away as the, the dark, the dark legs. Of course, I'm covering perhaps, um, the, you know, another part of the leg here, um, but the rest of the field marks point towards uh, bay breasted warbler. On the <clears throat> on the right hand side, you have a bird that, gosh, uh, this one here. You've got well, you've got a lemon yellow belly. You've got some dark streaking here. Can't really see the wings too well, but look at the face. It looks like it kind of has spectacles here, um, but really, what I'm going to be focusing on is this dark patch below. Again, this bird has that look reminiscent of a bird that's hasn't had enough sleep. It's got the, the those bags under its eyes, and um, that characteristic, um, you know, added added to the lemon yellow belly tells me that this is a young prairie warbler. So look in, you know, kind of focus on the face. Look at that facial structure, and it it can help when you get some of these darker streaks on the side. Um, but if you, this was in person, you'd see this bird is um, bobbing its tail up and down, um, and that's a great field mark for the species. A um, couple others here, very plain looking birds. We'll go uh, down the middle. Um, very fine streaks on this bird, has some yellow in the face, two white wing bars, kind of gray overall. Uh, has a really sharp bill that does seem to kind of, in my you know, uh, opinion bend downward um, in its at, at its terminus. So I would I would call this bird in the center here um, a Cape May warbler. Um, lower left, I threw this in here, uh, and I would say this this would be a tough bird to just ID from the photo, um, but we'll try it. It's got a a yellow vent. So that's really key, this lower left-hand bird, low, a yellow vent. Um, and you're going to see a little bit of what helps me idea it in its face. So it has a, a, um, a strike through the eye and a little faint kind of handlebar mustache, but overall it's lack of any defining characteristics along with, if you saw it in the field, it's bobbing tail. will tell you that this is a palm warbler. Uh, possibly, probably a first year. Um, middle bottom, you've got, well, you've got a bird that has a little bit of orange on its side, a little bit of uh, orange and yellow on its head, but it also has that kind of uh, dark um, kind of patch on its, on its face, contrasting with a light or white uh, colored throat, and then a little bit of these eye arcs going on here. So this is a yellow rumped warbler here. Can't see the yellow rump, um, but you can see from some other characteristics, I would say mostly in the face, but also in this nice um, extent of the, of the yellow on its sides. That's very helpful. Uh, let's go up to the middle right here. Um, gray and yellow and white. Uh, overall, this bird is with um, kind of a faint white eye ring two white wing bars and a tail that looks like it was dipped in ink, which is the telltale uh, field mark ingredients for a magnolia warbler in non-breeding plumage. And then I think uh, 
tying with the palm warbler, the one on the lower right is probably going to give most of us a headache. Um, uh, you've got, what can you work with here? You've got two white wing bars. Otherwise, it's very uh, kind of dark. I think it might have, this photo might have been taken maybe under a canopy. Um, but you know what? In my sight, I see kind of a, a light, a light bit of color extending forward from the eye. And you've also got a bit of those eye arcs there. Um, I would probably want to be watching this bird to see what its behavior is. It doesn't look to be in the telltale tree that I might expect it to be in, um, but this looks, uh, looks, looks like, and it is, a first year uh, pine warbler. So uh, this bird, you're going to want to see in the field, again, larger bill, larger bodied warbler overall. Um, so, so that can be, that can be a really tough bird. It's an incredibly common bird, but the, but the pine warbler is one of the toughest to ID and throws all, you know, all manner of, of birders off when they're, when they're out in the field. But I thought I'd throw all of these um, ball birds in here in the mix for you to, to get you excited about getting out there and continuing your journey to understanding confusing fall warblers. Um, and just to put the cherry on top, these four birds are birds that I would love to see any fall. Um, the bird in the upper left is a yellow-breasted chat. It is the largest of our warblers. It is a skulker and we only really get it in the fall as a, as a vagrant. Um, the bird in the upper right is a white-eyed vireo. It's a mid-Atlantic species, but we'll often get them along the coast in the fall as they disperse and start to head south. Um, really stunning looking birds. And then two birds on, a, on the bottom, the one on the left, gosh, that looks a lot like some of the warblers we've seen, but this is orange crowned warbler. This bird nests high up in the taiga of northern Canada, uh, much more common in fall than in spring. And this bird is overall kind of um, yellow gray uh, appearance. Um, it has a kind of a faint hood, but what's really helpful for identifying um, features is the short, sharp bill, a line through the eye. So that's that eye line is really helpful. And it also has a yellow vent. Um, this bird loves to be in um, like scrubby, close to the ground. Um, so you'll see it around with uh, common yellow throats and some of the other kind of skulky warblers that hang out in, um, you know, ragweed and uh, goldenrod and things like that. So keep an eye out for um, golden crown warblers. And then the bird on the right, which is a relative of our morning warbler. This is the Connecticut warbler, which nests in central Western Canada, but migrates through New England in September. Uh, it has an overall darker kind of appearance, um, olive gray throughout uh, compared to the morning warbler. Again, football shaped a lot like the other um, two warblers in its, in its genus, the uh, McGilvery's in the morning. It has a bold white, eye ring. That's the, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the telltale sign. You've got to have that um, or else you're not going to be 100% really that it's a, that it's a Connecticut warbler. Um, and again, the, the football shape is aided by those long undertail coverts, which make the tail look really, really short. Um, unlike many warblers, the Connecticut warbler walks a lot like the oven bird. So um, unlike the hopping of the morning warbler, which looks similar, the Connecticut walks and it walks on branches, it walks on the ground. So if you see a bird that looks um, like a morning warbler but has a, an eye ring and it's walking, get a photo and be really excited because that's a Connecticut warbler and that's pretty rare um, here for New England. So just some of those uh, lasting field marks, lemon yellow belly in the chat, white iris of the white Iberio, eye strike of the orange crown warbler along with a vent, and the bold white eye ring of the Connecticut along with its up under tail coverts. And it's walking. All right, we've got some resources. The Warbler Guide, Birding by Ear, 
the how-to guide offered by Merlin. Larkwire is a great website for understanding and learning bird song. Birding by Radar, which helps us to um, forecast a bit uh, for uh, fallouts and, and migration patterns. And adding to that is BirdCast, the Cornell's bird migration forecast in real time, which is really exciting. Um, so I can keep it here for a second. And I'd also like to add that um, for those of you who don't know, I am transitioning out of the state of New Hampshire, trying to get into some other work in the state of Maine, where I have a lot of family. And so for those of you who'd like to continue contact for future programs, um, feel free to email me at my new birding email. And I'd love to go out and get um, some, some fall warblers with you. And then as the fall progresses to winter, come to the coast and we can go out and look for really cool birds along the along the shore of the main coast. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you this fall and winter. And I'm gonna stop the share, see who's left, see who survived. And Rick's got his thumb up. Um, so if we wanna take some questions, we can. We're, we've gone a few minutes over, um, but I'm, I'm happy to. If folks want to just shout some questions out, um, feel free, but remember to unmute yourself. All right, I've got a little hand. Oh, is that a hand clap? Okay, that's a hand clap. Yeah, thank you, Susie. clapping, I think. <laughs> not, a, not a hands raised, but thank you. Great. Yes. Well, I was walking down a, a dirt camp road earlier in the summer, and I happened to find a, an expired chestnut-sided warbler. But it was so cool to be able to hold it in my hand and open its wings and really look at it. And it's amazing how small they are and how seemingly delicate, but also strong yeah. they are. And, not, you know, not to condone what Audubon did by slaying tens of thousands of birds to do his research. But boy, it really was nice to be able to hold it in my hand and spin it around and open its wings and, and really, really look at it. I wish there was yeah. a way to, you know, like we, we stun the trout. I wish there was a way to whack the birds momentarily so we could really look at them closely. This, this well, that, that's, unfortunately, that does happen when you have window strikes and people often have, are able to hold them in their hand and look at them. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's due to a traumatic experience. <clears throat> but yeah, thank you, Tom. Anyone else getting out there? Seeing those, seeing those warblers? Hopefully. Yeah. Good. You're muted, Lori. Um, I did. <laughs> Great. I did. You know, we thought we thought we had an orange crown warbler today. So, I mean, it so was, I'm glad you said like three times that they're easily confused with this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, our instructor of the evening informed me, unfortunately, that it was a yellow warbler. So. <laughs> Go out, but expect to be fooled. That's all I can say. Absolutely. Yeah. It's always fun. It's always a lot of fun. Yeah. It's all kinds of good stuff. So. Yeah. Something Definitely. always happens. You know, yeah. really great. Yeah. All right. Well, if there are any other questions, thank you all. Feel free to contact me. We'll be in touch and we'll see you, hopefully, many of you for that walk on the 26th. Nice job. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Thanks, Thank well. you all. Thanks.